All righty. Hey, guys. Welcome back to... You gotta redo that. <laughs> so bad. Oh, my God. All right. Hey, guys. <laughs> Let's go. Oh. <laughs> uh... Hey guys, welcome back to The Meg Show, episode 8, week 8, another exciting week of lacrosse. We saw some upsets, which we love to see. We love to see the leaderboard get shaken up here. One of the first games that we're going to go through was on our board last week, UNC-BC, big ACC matchup. Whenever these two teams come and play against each other, it's always a good game to watch. This year, BC won 18 to 12. It was BC's pink game. So they really kind of showed out for it. UNC did start off the scoring for the game, but BC quickly came back from that. Emily Pinto had four straight goals um, in that first and second quarter to really kind of kick off BC's lead. She actually finished the day with seven goals and two assists. So that's a really big point day for her. She was a very, very big reason as to why BC was able to pull away from UNC like this. There was also three other players that had multiple point days, Kayla Martello, McKenna Davis, Cassidy Weeks, names we've all heard many, many times before. Um, BC basically kind of controlled the whole game. They led at the half, eight to five, and they were kind of able to pull away, putting up 10 second half goals to secure the win. Their goalie, Shea Dolce, 13 saves. Very, very talented goalie. Had a huge day for her as well. For UNC... Wasn't really quite their day. They did dominate on the draw circle. They won 22 draws compared to, um, sorry, I think BC actually won the draw game. Now I'm thinking about it. Either way, BC did dominate minus that draw circle thing. UNC's Darcy Felter, she had four goals, and Alyssa Long had three goals to lead the scoring for the Tar Heels. Overall, this is an ACC matchup, a game you want to watch, and they really showed up. And congrats to BC on a really, really solid pink game. Yeah, it's always a great matchup, um, especially, as you mentioned, in conference. I'm sure we'll see them again go head-to-head. I Two things, Emma Lopinto, seven goals insane against a team like UNC. What a great day for her. Also, I love how BC has multiple different uniforms. They have different themes for games I think that is so cool I wish other schools would do that I wish we did that Syracuse I always wanted like an orange jersey they used to have that but I guess they tended they tend to lose when they wore that orange Bad jersey mojo. so that's superstitious got, like that yeah so that got canceled but I love how BC does that they had the pink game the red bandana game they have multiple different just regular season jerseys um so I I think that's such a great idea for, for them um and other teams should start doing that as well Next game we had was Michigan versus Maryland. Maryland won 8-6. to six. It was Michigan's first loss of the season, um, which is kind of surprising. I'm surprised. I was very surprised that that's their first loss so far. Nothing against Michigan, but, I mean, they've we been playing. Michigan. Yeah, they've been playing some tough games, but, yeah, they've been, they've been doing very well, but Maryland was able to hand them the first loss of the season. Very low-scoring game, which is kind of, a, kind of surprising for us. Um, I think both of them are great threats on offense and have such strong offenses, offensives if you watch them. But I guess defense had a great job that day. Um, Maryland was held to a scoreless second quarter, and then Michigan was held scoreless in the fourth quarter. So for Maryland, the four goals in the third quarter was a huge winning factor for them. It really helped them pull ahead. Clevenger, she had three goals, and then Hannah had two to lead the way for the Terps, so great days for them. Um, but I guess three goals and two goals is very low, but when the score is eight to six, I guess that's what you're going to get. And then Jill Smith and Julia Schwabe both had two goals for Michigan. Um, in terms of overall stats, Michigan did crush the ground ball game 23 to 10. Very gritty of Michigan. So gritty. Love to see that. And then in terms of shots, Michigan took 28 shots compared to Maryland's 19, which is a big difference. That's just about 10. Um, and then Maryland had the better shooting day, I guess. So took 10 less shots, but they put more in the back of the net. So big, big conference win for Maryland uh, over the weekend. 
Definitely agree. I was definitely surprised that it was that low scoring given how dominant their offenses are. But honestly, it's not going to be your game every game. So things kind of happen like this sometimes. Our next game we were watching was one that I was really excited for. Our previous guests on the podcast, Madison Doucette and Hopkins, they took down JMU with a very, very convincing win, 21 to 13. JMU came out firing on all cylinders. They put up, I mean, sorry, Hopkins came out firing on all cylinders, (laughs) put up 13 goals in that first half. Putting up 13 goals like that in a half, that is going to put you in a very, very good position to dominate that second half as well. Ava Angelo put the offense on her back. She had six goals on the day, which is so, so huge. She really showed up for her team. Maeve Barker and Campbell Case also had four goals on the day. And Ashley Mackin had herself a day with a hat trick. So multiple players were putting up multiple points. And when you have that many people putting up multiple goals, not just the assist parts of it as well, even though those are good, having those people put up multiple goals, that really helps your case. And then on JMU side, we had Olivia Mattis and Isabella Peterson having hat tricks for JMU. Unfortunately, they just kind of couldn't pull that together there that way. Um, For Hopkins, something that kind of saw in that stat sheet was Hopkins took 47 shots total. And when you're putting up that amount of shots against a defense against a goalie, it makes it really, really difficult to kind of continue to keep up that energy to make those stops. So good for Hopkins for putting up those shots and even better job on having that shooting day. But overall, top to bottom, Hopkins kind of just dominated the game, pulled out a big win. Congrats to the Blue Jays. Yeah, what a great win for Hopkins. I love to see that. Just really dominating that game. It's a, a top um, top opponent against JMU. They're ranked. So being able to pull ahead 21-13 is very dominating for them and just proves that they, they do deserve to be in the top 10, <clears throat> which they got this week, as we'll talk about later. But Hopkins is really – Keep an eye making, out. Yeah, Keep they're an making a name for themselves this year. Tim McCormick's doing a great job over there, but I was very excited to see Hopkins come out on top. The next game we had was Yale versus Brown. Yale won 10 to 5, which I, I thought Brown was going to win, honestly. Brown's been, been having a great season so far, but good job to Yale. Very great in conference matchup for the Ivies. Um, but yeah, the Bulldogs came out on top. And then in terms of overall stats for both teams, it's fairly even matchup. Um, Yale had 14 cause to- turnovers, which is crazy. A lot. Yeah. And then Fallon Vaughn had a hat trick, four ground balls and five cause turnovers. So she was all over the field, making impacts wherever she could. So great day for her, um, really helping out her team, but Yale held, held Brown to 10 shots on net where Brown was averaging about 27 shots on net, um, per game. So solid defensive day to just really hold them to 10 shots and, Shout out to Yale's defense. But with that being said, Yale is still undefeated, sitting at 9-0. and They are the last undefeated team, which is awesome for them. Um, I don't know off the top of my head who they have left in this season. I actually should have looked at that, but I'm curious to see if anyone can knock them off. Um, well, they've got before. BC up next. Okay, yeah. So BC yeah. up next. That'll be a good <laughs> matchup for them. We'll see if they can hold on to that undefeated record yeah. for this season. Good luck, good luck to Yale. Yes. And that last game that we were watching was Albany versus Bryant, and it is definitely a game that did not disappoint. Albany did pull away with the win, 14-11. The stats for this game were pretty even across the board. Um, Something that we've talked about previously is having these low-scoring quarters or being held scoreless. Bryant was held to one goal in the third quarter, where Albany was putting up five in the third quarter. Those differences in like a kind of lower-scoring game like that or – at least for Bryant. You can't really have a one-goal quarter. Um, But Albany had 10 second-half goals, which was huge. Kenna from Bryant, Kenna Kout, six goals on 10 shots and five draw controls. She has been so dominant for this Bryant team. She has – they also do this hat that they wear. I don't know what the specifics are for it, but it's like – it's kind of like this hat almost, but it has like a spray paint thing on it. I want to look inside and see what that's more about. It's like players of the game or something like that. Um, She's pretty familiar with wearing that (laughs) hat, I think. Uh, (laughs) But she had a day for herself and, you know, being very versatile on the draw circle and on offense as well. 
for Albany, Grace McCauley. She had six goals on nine shots. So that's a good shooting day for her, for sure. And then Katie Pascal, three goals, four assists, seven points, five draw controls, and two cost turnovers. She has been Albany's go-to girl since she stepped on campus, and she can, continues to prove that each year she's been there. So huge, huge win for Albany. Very happy for you. That's that's a good win to pull away with. Yeah, overall, great games over the weekend. A ton of um, upsets, a ton of you know teams that are expected to win are winning and coming through with those wins. So overall, the season just continues to get better and better. A few games that we did miss, just two that I, we wanted to note was Duke beat UVA, which is huge for them. They've been sort of struggling here and there a little bit to get something going. That's it. Won a huge ACC win and just a great win over a top ranked opponent. Um, so shout out Duke for that win because that is crazy and that's going to help them. Hopefully they can continue to ride that momentum. Yeah, I think Duke, they've really been waiting for a win like this. They've been struggling in conference and out of conference. Um, Caroline DeBellis. So normally when we talk about Duke, we talk a lot about uh, Katie DeSimone. Caroline DeBellis, she sneaks in there. She's sneaky in there. I'm pretty sure she had like a seven-point day to really help put Duke over UVA. So shout out to you. That's a fantastic day. Yeah, huge day for her. And another game was Denver won, but they only beat Georgetown by one, which is very interesting. When I was looking at games the other week, might have been a week or two ago, so it's definitely different now, but Georgetown was two and five. Like they, they've been struggling. Um, they need something to change with that program, but for Denver to only beat them by one is something to keep an eye on. Um, I, I don't think it, you want to keep an eye on Georgetown. I think you want to keep an eye on Denver to see how good are they actually. Uh, I think last season they created a lot of hype around their names, and this year I think they're a little bit quieter, um, sort of having a little bit tougher of a season, but to only beat Georgetown by one is a little um, – interesting I would say so something to note there they'd still got the win but should have been different scoring <clears throat> agreed and now that we have recaps last week we saw some great wins that we were expecting some upsets always keeping us on our toes this season and we were actually just talking about this with some friends how in previous seasons sometimes when teams would go into games you would predict who was going to win and you were most likely going to be right mm -hmm. unless something kind of crazy happened but this season insane like why does anyone else feel this way like why is it so crazy I don't know who's going to win it's like every game we go into it's like oh this person could win but they might not <laughs> <laughs> but you're they might so not right. you're so right <laughs> but looking ahead to this week we've got some interesting games scheduled this week um, first up for Wednesday, we've got Princeton and Penn playing each other in conference game. That's going to be a good matchup. Penn is playing really, really well right now. So definitely tune into that one. We have that. We've got Georgetown versus Xavier. Georgetown's just coming off of this loss from Denver by one. I would take that and use that as momentum to push forward, you know, put a little bit of confidence in that. We've got Sienna versus Niagara and Denver versus Colorado. Uh, that's all on Wednesday. And then looking ahead towards Saturday, we've got or Oregon versus USC. Sometimes I say Oregon weird, so I have to like watch myself. <laughs> <laughs> and then we've got Northwestern Maryland, another in-conference matchup that should be a pretty good game. Northwestern's a very dominant team. Maryland's playing really well. So we will see with that game. That one will be a tough, tough choice for me at least. I agree. I agree. I, I hope it's a close game. I hope it's not a blowout one way or the other. I hope it's a close, good game to watch. Um, but yeah, I don't know who I want to go with. Maybe I'm thinking Maryland. Who knows? Literally, who knows who's going to win this year? Yeah, not sure. Um, but that being said, going into the rankings for this week, love, uh, love seeing what it's going to be, love seeing what they come up with each week. Um, we got Notre Dame at, at number one. I disagree. I think it is just so. I don't know who you would put at number one. Just, exactly. There just shouldn't be one. <laughs> just take away the number one spot. Just it's just a blank. <laughs> we can't do it. Um, I just think it's so difficult because of these upsets mm -hmm. to really solidify someone as number one because it could go like, I would say it could go like five different ways realistically. 
just based on what the season's looking like so far and how everything is shaping up. I think, Meg, if you could put somebody else at number one, who are you putting there? Hopkins. I'm just kidding. I just love them. They're doing so well. Um, I don't know. Literally, I would leave it blank if I did my own ranking. <laughs> I just screw everyone down. Um, my only thing is Syracuse beat Notre Dame. Northwestern lost to Penn State. Syracuse lost to Maryland. And who else did they lose to? Not a memory off the top of my head. Uh, beginning of the season, who they just who they lose to? I don't um, remember. Uh, Boston College at four. I honestly have no idea who I'd put at number one. Loyola eight is. I guess Loyola like, is not getting the respect that they deserve. I don't think. I think they could be above Michigan, but other than that. I'd love to see Loyola and Penn play each other. Me too. That'd be what like well we Penn were, at five is kind of crazy to me. Yeah, we hosted the we hosted playoffs one year on our soccer stadium field and Loyola played Penn, no? You might be right. Who did we lose to? What do you mean? You said we lost one year? No, we hosted playoffs one year. Oh, yeah, yeah. I, I thought that Loyola won. played Penn, but I could be wrong. I know Penn was on our soccer field. I just don't remember who they played. But I would love mm-hmm. to see those two teams match up. We have a really talented Penn team and a very talented Loyola team. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know. Number one spot is definitely difficult to choose, but I think looking at the rest of the rankings, I'm liking it. Yeah. Interesting to see Stanford hanging out in the top 20. Agreed. Agreed. It's also the different, we've talked about this all the time too, like the different rankings. Yeah, like different rankings. So who knows? But I think I like, I like Notre Dame at number one. I'm a Notre Dame like fan. I'm loving that Stan- they're having such, no, I really am. Me too. I'm, don't, don't get me wrong, but <laughs> I'm, I'm loving somehow- that they're having a very good season. We've talked about it in previous episodes before, but Notre Dame is always that team that you know you're going to get a really aggressive game. They're going to come out with all the energy in the world. They just really haven't been able to get over that hump in recent years. So seeing them kind of play like this uh, heading into the second half of the season, that's definitely where you want to see them uh, head in that direction for sure. Trending, yeah. Um, Yeah, just continue to see each week what's going to change. All right, time to get into our questions. Let's see here. Our first one. Would you consider hosting a women's NCAA lacrosse tournament pool? Listeners could submit completed brackets for Meg in parentheses, not March Madness. Maybe we could give out prizes for first, second, and third places. Maybe we could get some gate merch going. Question mark. That's from one of our uh, listeners. Not sure who, but I think that's a great idea. Something we could consider. I definitely have no doubt that Gate wouldn't have any issue with maybe getting some some free gear going out, whether it's a hat, shirt, a head, a stick. Who knows? But I think that's a great idea. That could be something fun to look into. Make sure there's no rules against that or anything. I think current players wouldn't be able to do it. Um, because that would be considered betting, I believe. Yeah, there's some stuff that we should probably look into, but I think that's a really fun idea. Mm-hmm. I love that. Um, I think it'd be really difficult because of just how crazy these games have been this season, but I think for playoffs, that'd be a lot of fun. Um, so we will definitely look into that, but I love it. Meg Madness. That's funny. Do you have any idea on how we could do that? Me? Have any... No, I'm saying like anyone listening, if you have any oh. idea on how we could do that, like logistically, like is there a website or something? I, I can do some reach, research, but got to figure out how we can have our own terminant pool, but also are there what like did brackets you just online? Say? Tournament pool? I thought you said terminant. <laughs> Ter- uh. No, tournament pool. Like, um, and I don't know, can people even do bra- like women's across brackets online like you can for... March Madness. I'm sure somebody does somewhere out there. So 
if anyone has ideas, it could be really fun. And I'd love to give out prizes. We'll do some, do some, Got some fun stuff. So we'll look into it for sure. Cool. Um, next question. Could you give some advice on recruiting from overseas girls? I want to get recruited from the UK, but so much harder, but it's so much harder as I don't have the U S connections. It's a very fair question. Um, Meg, do you have any ideas? Yeah. So, um, uh, I think something that just in general for recruiting is making sure, and something that's really huge these days is, oh, we were talking to Sierra about this. Uh, one of the assistant coaches at UMBC, we played with her at Syracuse. She was saying to make sure that you have highlight reels and you're signing up for these recruiting websites almost. Um, where you can post your highlight reel and then coaches can go on there and look. Um, so make sure that if you, you know, you are from across or overseas, you want to come play in the U S I would say definitely make sure that you can kind of pull together a highlight reel tape. Um, and then there's also just the old fashioned, like reaching out to coaches and emailing them. A lot of their emails or all of them really should be found on different schools websites. So let's say Syracuse is, you know, a school you want to go to. Um, the coach's emails should just be on the website. So you can reach out to them and say, hi, I'm so-and-so I'm from here. Um, I'm really interested in this school. Um, and then if you have a highlight reel, you can attach that or if not, just maybe talk about some highlights of yourself, which I know can be kind of awkward sometimes, but definitely hype yourself up a little bit. If you want to be super valuable, you want to show off your skills because you deserve to talk about them. So I definitely say the highlight tape, definitely reach out to coaches. And then also if you uh, try out for sign up, try out for your like kind of national team. So when all these teams come together and play in the world championships, like where was it two years ago in Towson? Was that two years ago? Um, Like world championships. So it was either a year or two ago, but a bunch of different countries, they brought their national teams down to Towson, Maryland. They played in the summer. Team US, um, oh, yeah. Team Ireland, Team Germany. There's Team Puerto Rico. So there's so many different options. So if you know that there is you know, a team in your country that you're interested in playing for, then definitely try out for that because you can come and you guys, everyone will play at like a certain location. I don't know where the next one is, but... You go and you play and you can get noticed that way. So I think just making sure you are kind of keeping your mind open, reaching out always helps because the worst that they can say is no, you know, like, or they just don't answer you. So it doesn't hurt and it's easily accessible. But I do think the biggest thing would be getting a highlight reel together. I agree. I think highlight reel Highlight reel, um, emailing, trying to get on the national team if you can, and doing your best to get to the U.S., which I know is not easy. That's Obviously, there's other solutions than getting here um, for like camps or whatever, but I'd say <clears throat> the hi highlight reel is the best way to go and start emailing those coaches. Try and get some connections going if you have any or if you know anyone in the U.S., we could, we could try and help. Um, another question is, do some people spend four years as a student athlete yet never get any actual playing time in games? So yes and no, it is, you can very much go four years and not start or not get playing time. Majority of the time there's going to be games, one, a few a season where you're probably blowing a team out and usually then those second string thir or third string fourth, fourth string players then get to go in for however many long, however many minutes long. So it depends, but it's, I, th I think that's kind of hard for some people is obviously you want to have high expectations and goals and you want to shoot for having playing time or starting, whatever it may be. But I mean, I know coming from Texas, I had friends that in Texas lacrosse back then wasn't as dominant as it was probably in Maryland or Long Island, like whoever you're like playing with on that club team is usually the best ones at their high school team as well. So then going to college, you're the best player in Texas, but 
at the time the competition's so different. So that was can be hard for players that are coming from non hotbeds where they are dominating back home, but then they get to college and everyone there is also the best player on the high school team, but they've probably been playing a little bit longer, whatever it may be, like the competition just it wasn't always the same. So having that expectation can be hard for players coming in because you obviously want to expect that of yourself and the best, but when it doesn't happen, it can be hard mentally and kind of hurt some people's confidence. So yeah, it is very possible that you come in and you don't get any actual playing time in games, but major, majority of the time people are going to see a little bit here and there, depending on who they're playing and how the season's going. Yeah, I have to agree. I think that's kind of, um, it's, it's just going to happen in college sports because there's only so many positions out there on the field and there's this many, there's this number of girls on the team. So obviously you have to you know, work for your spot. It's never something that's just handed to you. And you kind of have to prove that in your off seasons, during your seasons, whenever you can, just to kind of show your commitment and you're working on your craft. So it does happen where you might not really get playing time. Um, but it's just kind of the reality of it, you know? For sure. Next question. What are your favorite bus trip memories? Best and worst. I can tell you my worst because the brain kind of remembers bad things, I think, more than good ones. Um, but my worst bus experience was driving – oh, there could be two. But the one that comes to mind, the first one, is when – we talked about this before. When COVID hit and we had to drive home from UVA, that one was a tough bus ride just because we weren't expecting it. And – yeah. That one, I'd probably say. Or driving home from Notre Dame after losing in the ACCs. That was tough. Yeah, I'd say those two are up there with me um, or for me. Notre Dame was tough because we just got waxed by UVA for no reason. Like, we should have very easily beat them and actually just got destroyed by them. Um, one of our worst games. So, that was not fun. Another one I would add to the mix, a third one is the – bus ride home after losing in the national championship i was just gonna say that i was just gonna say that that yeah. was the longest five hours of my life i think yeah that was sad and so annoying but yeah. so sad <laughs> yeah definitely would have rather been driving home after a win that's a winner but, but we're losers just kidding can't win them all but my best or my favorite um I don't think I have a specific like favorite memory of like a bus ride home, but I think it's just like, you know, coming off a good win where like the whole team like really kind of came together for 60 minutes. Those bus rides home were always like high energy, good fun. Um, and then we could like stop and get like a sweet treat or something, but I don't know. Those I like a good team win. Those bus ride homes or those bus ride home, <clears throat> bus rides home are really good. Yeah, or like any of the ones where, like, people have to sing on the bus. Those are always entertaining. Oh, yeah. I forgot about that. Yeah, those are fun. Um, yeah, any time after a win is fun. Getting some ice cream, some little treat. Um, but in talking about traveling, how do you handle it when you miss class due to travel for games, whether it's class, a test? Um, project how do you how do you handle that when you're gone for a game and you're traveling i would say most of the time professors are very understanding of like student athletes and when they're in season that you know they might not be able to attend a class um due to just kind of travel requirements but you also have to be respectful of their time as well so it's not like you can kind of walk into class on a Tuesday and you're leaving on a Thursday and say, Hey professor, like team's leaving Thursday. I'm going to miss class or I'm not going to be able to take this test because that doesn't give them any time to prepare for you to help you kind of make those arrangements with the tests or um, with the class lectures and stuff like that. So with that, I think it's just making sure that you're staying on top of it. For me, something I would do is I would like make friends in the class if I didn't have any of my teammates in there and reach out to them be like, Hey, I'm not going to be in class. Like if there's anything important or notes, like, would you mind just sending them to me after? Um, 
just so you can kind of stay on top of it so you can do well in class too. So making sure you're just being respectful of the professor's time and making sure you're speaking with your um, classmates, it's definitely super helpful um, to make sure you can kind of jump back in that next week and be able to be caught up with the rest of the class. Yeah, um, definitely looking ahead. Usually our, um, for Syracuse at least, our athletic advisor would give us a sheet at the beginning of the year um, or semester that had when we're gone for games and like when we'd be missing class. So being able to give that to a professor ahead of time so they know they have a list of your games and when you're going to be gone and just sort of coordinating around travel and just looking ahead. That's the biggest thing. So they can help you and you can figure out what you got to do before you leave. Yeah. And it's not just like, you're not the only person that's doing it. You're not the only sport that's doing it. These professors understand, you know, the life of it. It's just being respectful and then you'll basically be fine through it. Mm -hmm. For sure. Um, another question, how do you manage stress during busy times in the semester and athletic season? That's a great question. I think stress is just kind of, especially during season, it's just kind of bound to happen almost because you're going to get to that midpoint in the semester where you might have a midterm in all five of your or four of your classes, whatever. And you're heading into like that second half of your season where, you know, you're kind of counting down the games until the end and stuff like that. So I think when it comes to managing it, for me, a lot, I would just write it down. So if I, which just sounds just so simple, but if I knew I had this assignment, this class, and like um, this presentation, I had so many presentations, but this presentation on, you know, a Wednesday or something, I would make sure that it's written down. And that's something you can do at like the beginning of your semester and the begin beginning of your season two. I know Meg loves the Google Calendar or the Google Sheets. I think you should elaborate on that actually because you know it better than I do. Yeah. Um, I was a big, um, shoot. What was the platform called that I used? Um, oh, wow. I can't remember. Anyways, there's this one platform I would use that I could put every single assignment, test, quiz, anything due or had an important date. I could put it in this like platform website thing, have the due date, color code it with what class it was. And then it would just put it in chronological order, like by date. Um, like soonest to farthest away or whatever. So that was huge for me. I'm a big calendar to do list, uh, to do list. Um, that's why I'd say I like to be very organized like that, having a planner, or whatever, writing it down. Um, but that was what I would do to sort of help me figure out, okay, what do I need to get done? What can I get done first? What do I need to get done first? What's going to take me the shortest amount of time so I can cross that off. I'm a big crossing things off a to-do list person uh, that helps me just feel more organized and uh, really let me see everything I do need to get done and then I can plan accordingly. But yeah, I think time management is huge, which you just learn throughout your years and people help you. Yeah. So I'd say definitely as far as stress, making sure you're writing down what you have to do so you don't have to stress about a last minute paper, which mm -hmm. was always the worst. It does happen sometimes yeah. where you're like, oh my God, I missed it. But It'll be okay. You'll be fine. It's One, just yeah, just a paper. You'll get through it because um, it happens to everybody really. But making sure you're writing stuff down and also taking time to yourself as well, right? Self-care is super important and making sure that you can remain level-headed kind of and not kind of dig yourself into a hole or get too worked up over things. So whether that's you know taking time to maybe just go for a walk or read a book, stuff like that, just to kind of give your brain that second to just kind of turn off for a little while that uh really helped me but i think i would watch um like how i met your mother and just zone out for <laughs> um the last thing i would say is just ask for help like it's totally fine to ask for help it's you're not bothering anyone you're helping yourself you're going to let other people know that you need help and they can help you there's people out there that are resources for you um, so I would say the biggest thing is if you need help, just ask for help, no matter what it is, what you need help with, there's someone out there to help you. Um, and everyone's looking out for you and wants the best for you. So they're going to help you in any way they can, but definitely ask. No one, no one can read your mind. So 
don't expect them to know, but definitely ask for help and try and ask before it's too late. But if it is too late, still ask. Yeah, they all want you to succeed. No one is really out to see you fail. So don't stress about the little things because it all will be okay in the end. (laughs) But with that too, another question we got was how do you make sure that you have enough downtime to prevent burnout? That's a really good question. That's a good question. I think burnout, I experienced it every year that I was in college. And it was mostly just at the end of the season. Like once it was over, I was like, first of all, I was upset that it was over, which isn't burnout yet, but there's a point to this. Obviously, I was upset it's over. It didn't really end how I wanted it to for any of the years that I was playing. But afterwards I was kind of like okay like I can finally give my body a break like I could take my mind off of lacrosse for a little while and that would be heading into summer break so I'd kind of take that time in June to just really recoup myself recoup my mind um continue to just remember that you're a student athlete but you're also a person so just do like normal things uh that weren't all revolving around lacrosse. Like my schedule wasn't revolving around lacrosse in that month, basically. So I would take that time to kind of go to the beach, hang out with my friends, do things that I actually really wanted to do when I was feeling that burnout kind of. So then that way, when August came around and I was going back to school, I would start training before then, obviously, but just get ready and get excited to play again. Cause I think burnout's a normal thing. Um, And I was fortunate enough to not experience it too severely where I just never wanted to pick up a stick again. But I think making sure you're doing things outside of your sport that you love is how you can kind of prevent that burnout. For sure. Um, I would say, I mean, it's definitely a valid feeling to have. Don't let it like scare you or don't, I don't know, don't be afraid of it because it is very valid and people have it, especially there's two times in the year where I always noticed it. One is in the fall when, or there's three times. One is in the fall when you're not really not really like playing for anything like I mean that by there's no ranking in the fall there's no tournament or like uh, championship in the fall so you're sort of playing each other you're for a very long time and there's very few times where you get to play other teams so it's very repetitive um, second is then preseason when it's just a grind you're grinding you've probably got a few two days you've got a run test you're practicing for a very long time you're getting back into lifting um and you're still not playing any competition yet and it's right there you can taste it like you can smell it the real the real deal starts very soon but until then you're just doing the same thing over and over uh just playing your own team and that gets it can get boring after a while like you want to play someone new you want to compete against a team where it's gonna matter for the tournament or the ranking or whatever it may be just has a little bit more value to it and then the third time where i would feel it is it's a little, I don't know. I go back and forth. Um, end of the season when school ends and all you have is lacrosse. You're still in season. Everyone on campus is gone. School is over. You're literally living the same day over and over again. You wake up, you go to practice, you go do treatment, you probably watch film or lift, and then you go home and do it all over again for however long, especially in between conference and then NCAA tournament starting. You're done with school. You're not playing any games. You're waiting for the NCAA tournament, so you're playing just your team again. Um, and that can get a little tough mentally when you're living the same day over and over. Uh, if the weather's not nice out yet. It can be really tough. But I would say that is – it's hard because that's such a fun time of year where you're playing in the conference play and you're looking forward to the NCAA tournament. You're hoping to get to the Final Four, so that can be really hard. But that is such a fun time of year. But now you're living the same day over and over. Um, it is. It can go either way. I don't know. I guess now that I'm saying it out loud, I don't know if I actually thought that was burnout because that's also the best time of year because you're done with school. You're just there to play lacrosse, which is what every student wants to do. Um, I just wish I could go to school and play lacrosse and not have done school, but that's not realistic. So it is a fun time. You can really focus on lacrosse. You can go shoot for fun outside of practice and just mess around with your friends. but it can get tough mentally when you're living the same day over and over. Yeah. And not to say like, it's like, it's a very, it's a privilege to be able to have that experience. And 
even though like what that like what we were just talking about kind of might sound like it's like oh what the heck like the end of season you guys are like burnt out it's not like that was during that time frame it's just like looking back on it like the end of it it's like oh i'm so excited to take a break so it Mm -hmm. is the burnout in that sense but during that time and that month really that when you're in those playoffs without school it is you like what you work all year for so it's like as much as it's like so repetitive it's a privilege to be able to have these days be able to practice because not everybody gets it. You know, some people school ends and, you know, they don't make playoffs and then they go home, you know? So it's not to say like not grateful to have the experiences like that. Just trying to explain that, you know, even when you're going far in playoffs, people still have these thoughts. So I thought that was a good question. Another question we have is kind of relates to that a little bit, but what motivates you to, or what motivated you to play in college? Um, for me, a few things. One, I wanted to play at the highest level. Um, so I wanted to, I guess now you could consider professional or national the highest level, but in terms of at the time, what was realistic for me in high school is I wanted to compete at the highest level. I wanted to play at a top D1 school and I wanted to win a national championship. So that's what drove me in, in high school and trying to get recruited and practicing and s- spending time outside of practice on lacrosse too. But I was missing out on fun things with my friends, but I knew it was going to pay off. And I really wanted to try and get that big win um, that every kid dreams of. So that is what motivated me. Um, also just the will to win. I hate losing. I'm probably the biggest sore loser ever because I literally hate it so much. So I didn't want to lose. So I was going to compete and do everything I could to try and win and get better to help my team. Um, and yeah, try and win. So I mean, I could keep going about this answer, but basically I hate losing and I wanted to compete for a national championship. Yeah. I wish you guys all could have seen Meg, like after a loss, <laughs> she was the most grumpy person ever. Like driving home with her, whether it was like from the dome or, or from Manly when we got back from an away game, was not super fun because she really <laughs> does hate losing. Wait, Meg, do you think you hate losing more or what's that question actually? Do I hate losing more or do I like winning more? Is yeah, basically that's the question. Ask. Yeah. I think I hate losing. I literally hate it so much. It makes me sick. It makes me literally want to throw up. (laughs) And I just feel like a loser. Not that anyone is a loser for losing, but like, it's just annoying, embarrassing, especially if it's a blowout. And what's, I think it's also frustrating for me because I know we could, could have won any game that we were playing in, which is frustrating because then we wouldn't win. So I don't know. What about you? Um, I think, I think I hate losing, but, but like, obviously I would winning is just yeah. so nice. Like yeah. I would love to know what it feels like to win a national championship. Yeah. I'm sure it's like a top five feeling. Um, but we've had pretty good wins and those all felt great. I just think no one wants to lose. I think human nature, you don't want to lose, you know? So especially when you're doing it with something like you care so much about that, that losing, that burning, it's like all my hard work, like, you know, that TikTok sound, all that work and what did it get me? Yeah. <laughs> it's like that. Like that's, It's like, oh, a yeah, I should make that TikTok. <laughs> <laughs> that actually and be funny. that picture you know that picture of me um from i literally think it's my freshman year i acted like i just lost the last game i was ever gonna play at lacrosse but we lost to northwestern in the elite eight um yeah and there's a picture of me after the game in the post-game press conference and i literally look like someone just murdered my whole family <laughs> like i look like it's so bad i should find it oh my god someone i actually just saw it not that long ago i could definitely find it yeah, you can definitely find it. I should make that TikTok. <laughs> That's a good one, actually. Um, but yeah, back to the original question. I think playing a sport in college, it's just something that whether you're doing it D1 or D2, D3, whatever it is you're doing it for, I think 
you have to understand like the commitment that it actually is and really love what you're doing to do it because otherwise it's a really difficult experience, I think. So my motivation was that I loved the sport and I know I wanted to go and I wanted to play somewhere big and um, things worked out fortunately. But I think to stay motivated too, you have to like, continue to think about your why. Like I know a lot of people do it or think about your why. Um, like what gets you up every day? What makes you want to push through this workout? What makes you want to run faster, play harder? Uh, so that motivation, that self-motivation, I think is so important. Just like that positive talk to yourself. Yeah, but great question. Um, last question. How important is feedback from coaches and how do you apply it to improve your performance? Wow. I think... <laughs> I think feedback from coaches, it's very important because they're the ones that put you on the field or don't put you on the field. So if your coach is telling you something like maybe like if some, if a coach is talking to me and they're like, Hey Meg, I need you to stop shooting stick side high. And if I went into practice that following week and took 20 stick side high shots, you know, that looks uncoachable, right? Because they're asking you to do something, you kind of have to do it. So I'd say any feedback from your coaches is important and to put that into your game because you want to play, your coaches are asking you for a change because they want to see you get better in your own play as well. Um, and whether that puts you on the field or doesn't, that could be a little bit of a teetering point there. So I'd say the feedback's really important and it also gives you time to be, you know, maybe more self-aware or self-reflect a little bit, especially if they show you film of yourself Doing it in a game. Um, yeah, you can't disagree at that point. That There's hardcore proof. You can't mm -hmm. even – you can't argue it because you're watching it. Um, so sometimes it can – you got to take the criticism, and sometimes it doesn't feel great. But it's all for all for the better. Yeah, it's not always easy pill to swallow, um, but you got to do it. It'll make you such a better person and player, both on and off the field. Like Meg said, it makes you coachable, which is more than just being on the field. Like That's just a good life skill to have. Um, and also just shows you care and that you're trying to get better. If you don't really understand what they're telling you, ask for one-on-one -on -one help, ask for extra work outside of practice. If you need help doing it. Um, but yeah, feedback is not always easy to take, but it's the best thing for you. Um, so you got to learn to learn to take it, soak it in, take a step back, look yourself in the mirror, um, and try and make a change. Yeah, because you're going to get feedback. It's not just in college sports. It's in life. You're going to get feedback for everything you do, whether it's in class, in, on a project, or in your future at your job when you have your annual review or something like that. So you're always going to get feedback. Sometimes it's going to be great. You could get really good feedback, and then you're going to want to keep doing those things. But there's also the bad feedback that you kind of have to adjust to as well. Yeah, but... I'll tell you, those uh, coaches' meetings will prepare you very well for the real world and any one-on-one -on -one meetings you have with the boss because nothing compares to that coaches' meeting after fall, before spring, at the end of the season. Oof. Yeah, it's um scary. It's scary business, um, but it does definitely prepare you for, like, interviews. I, like – was more so I was like talking about this. <laughs> I would get more nervous for those coaches meetings than for like interviews for jobs. I would be so stressed that walking into interviews for jobs, I felt like confident almost. And in fact, where I've done really hard things like that before. <laughs> um, but it's all to better prepare you to become a better future you. But yeah, that's all we got on this week's episode. Um, continue to send those questions in. Um, we look at them every week. So I love seeing what you guys have to ask and what you want to know more about. Makes it more fun for us and hopefully gives you just a deeper look and more behind the scenes. So that's all we got this week. Continue to tune in. Follow us on whatever you want to follow us on. Continue to watch Women's Across. And yeah. Yeah. Thank you guys again, and we will see you next week.